Well, some of you may remember that on January 7th of this year, we began a series called The Adventures of Acts. And as you can see on your handout that I hope you received at the door, the subtitle of that is How Jesus Uses Ordinary People to Change the World. Ordinary people just like us in this, in this church. I spoke about how the book in, in the Bible that's commonly called Acts is an adventure that's ongoing. It continues today as the church continues to grow throughout the world. And we are meant to be a part of that adventure here at Gateway East. Amen? Amen. The whole book of Acts is about mission. It's about the spread of the good news of Jesus so that people can know Jesus. And I hope, as David mentioned about praying about, that that's something that's important to all of us. Winning the loss, seeing the people who don't know Jesus coming to know him. Well, we took a break from that sermon series in the summer, intending to pick it up again in September. But as we reflected on the central place that the Holy Spirit has in the book of Acts, in the adventures of Acts, we felt we needed to pause after the summer to delve a little deeper into how the Holy Spirit helps us on this adventure. And so we took the past seven weeks to learn how we can hear the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. That was the the sermon series we just finished called Hearing God. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit a helper, and he helps us by speaking to us and guiding us. And I now want to continue the series on Acts for just a few weeks before December. We'll have a Christmas series in December, and then we'll finish this series on Acts in early 2025, Lord willing. The chapter in the Adventures on Acts that we're going to look at today has been referred to as the turning point or the centerpiece of the entire book. At the very beginning of the Adventures of Acts, Jesus said to his followers, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So here we immediately see mention of the Holy Spirit being our helper so that we can spread the good news about Jesus. But then in Acts chapter 15, the leaders of the church, and it was a church that began exclusively with Hebrew people, Jewish people, the They needed to have a debate to see how people from a non-Jewish background could fit into the church. They didn't understand that. Their whole background was a Hebrew background. All their religious thoughts had to do with the Hebrew religion. And they couldn't understand how a non-Hebrew could be a part of the church. So they, they had to have a debate about it. And after this chapter, we're no longer going to see the Apostle Peter in this book again as the work of the Apostle Paul among non-Jewish people becomes the new focus of the adventures of Acts as we continue reading. That means we're moving on in this chapter from the story's Jewish roots in Jerusalem to the story of Paul carrying the message of the good news of Jesus beyond Asia and into Europe as the church begins to become a diverse multi-ethnic, global community. If that hadn't happened, it's doubtful that any of us will be in this room would, have been here, would be here today. None of us would probably be here. In fact, that occurred to me after I prepared this eldership response form that I just explained. The names on that handout represent five political nations Canada, the United States of America, which isn't so united, Nigeria, Jamaica, and Philippines. Five different nations. But when the Bible talks about nations, it doesn't talk about nations with political boundaries, the way we, when we look on a map and we see the map of Nigeria and think that's a nation. The Bible uses the word ethnos for the word that we translate into the word nations. Ethnos is where we get the word ethnicity from. So a tribal group in Nigeria would be a nation, according to the biblical use of the word nation being an ethnos. And so 
if you consider the ethnicities of the people listed on the handout, there are eight nations represented, eight ethnicities, eight ethnos. Canadian, British, that's my wife Fiona, she was born to two British parents. Yoruba, that's a people group and ethnicity in Nigeria. Out of 542 people groups in Nigeria, the Yoruba are one of the major ones, and David is and, and David are both from Nigerian Yoruba background. Jamaican, Doreen is Jamaican. Japanese and American, Kyle happens to be from a, a Japanese father and an American mother, who ha, and his mother even has her own uh, patterns of descent, so there's many nations represented in Kyle, you can ask him about that if you want, and Surigo and Pampanga, those are two of the 202 people groups in the Philippines that Earl and Jocelyn represent. They, are, they come from two different language groups in the Philippines, even though they have a common language that is the official language of the Philippines. So eight ethnicities. Let's give the Lord a hand for all the nations that are in our midst. We are a very multi-ethnic community. We have many more nations just the, than the eight represented here. You know, just before the service started, I was saying hello to our Rwandan brother at the back. And, and we're, we, as a Ken here from Sudan has joined us. And his wife, Mercy, is from Kenya. And there's just so many more. Jeannie, who helps us with all the, the administration, is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You know, it's just, it's never ending. We can go on and on. And uh, that's right, Aline is from her sister who's just joined us from Congo. Chewy is from an, an, and Edith are from another tribe in Nigeria, the Igbo people. Isn't this wonderful how God has just added so many nations to our midst? I'm thrilled at how diverse Gateway East is and how diverse our leadership team has potential to be. Because God forbid that we should have a leadership team that doesn't reflect the diversity of the church. Gateway East is so diverse because of what happened in Acts 15. If Acts 15 hadn't happened, we wouldn't be here today. But in case you hadn't noticed, diversity has its challenges. Amen? And that was certainly true in Acts 15. So I've titled today's sermon, Joy Amidst the Challenges. And if you have a Bible here, I'd like you to turn to Acts 15. Um, even if your Bible is on your phone, uh, I didn't print the, the, chap, the, the passage on the handout, and I'm not going to read through it in, entirely. I'm just going to read through pieces of it. So if you want to see the passage as I'm reading it, you can open your Bibles either on your phone or on, in a paper. Acts 15, 1 to 35. How Jesus turns heaviness into joy is my first point. You know, I worked for Sudan... For, I worked in Sudan for a year when I was 23 years old, but before I went to Sudan, I trained in Jamaica, where, uh, where Doreen is from. And uh, it was no holiday, even though Jamaica is a tourist spot. It wasn't a holiday because I was living in the interior. We had to boil our own water. We had many neighbors nearby us who didn't even have electricity. Uh, there were actually rats in our kitchen. I killed a rat in our kitchen. And... Uh, he was sorry he ever came around. <laughs> As a part of our training, we had to do an early morning run every single day. Now, if you haven't been to Jamaica, you may not realize how rugged the terrain is. I lived in the St. Anne Parish. And in the St. Anne Parish, it's like if you look at the landscape, it's like one round hill after another. Just boom, boom, boom. These big round hills just all right next to each other, this cluster of them everywhere. And there were deep valleys in between these hills. So the roads there go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And so when we had to go to our early morning run, we had to run up, 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 and then down, 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 and then up, 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 up. Down, 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 again and again and again. Well, on the second or third hill, I got to confess something to you. I was 23 years old. I was in better shape than I am now, but not in good enough shape to handle those hills. And on the second or third hill, I literally, I'm not exaggerating here, 
This has never happened to me ever again, so thank you that God has just had mercy on me. But I literally, at some point going up the second or third hills, I literally had to stop because I couldn't put, I couldn't lift one leg to move it in front of the other. I had to use my hands and my arms to, I grab my thigh and I would physically push my thigh forward with my hand and then grab the other thigh and literally, I literally had to do that to get to the top of the hill. It was, out, it was outrageous that, that that was the only way I could move forward up the hill. Otherwise, I would have had to turn around and go backwards. I lost the ability to use my legs. And running wasn't all we had to do for that training. The schedule was packed. And we simply found it was too much. So we as a group, there was about 20 of us as being, being trained for different, going to different parts of the world. And we as a group went to our leaders and said, we can't handle this. This is, this is too much. And I don't think the leaders disagreed with us because they didn't give us any argument. And they weren't doing the stuff anyway. They weren't doing it alongside us. <laughs> they were just telling us what to do. But, and and they, they seemed to understand and they, they gave us some breaks and they lessened the load. We had said we can't do this. It's too heavy for us. And they turned our heaviness into joy because when they lessened the load, we truly rejoiced. We really did rejoice. It was wonderful. And the first words we read in Acts 15 are heavy. It says in verse 1, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, that is a restriction, isn't it? That was a heavy weight to put on the non-Jewish followers of Jesus. The first word, unless, represented human thinking. It didn't fit with the good news of Jesus. And we see in verse 5, just a little bit later, when they're in Jerusalem, those same men said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to, keep, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Well, that's a lot. That, that doesn't, does that sound like good news to people who, are, who thought they'd been freed from the, the, the law, the works of the law? That's not good news when Jesus came to set us free from the works of the law. They were saying that unless a man is circumcised, he can't be saved. They were also making obedience to the law of Moses a condition for salvation. Faith in Jesus wasn't enough for them. They wanted to add circumcision. And then to circumcision, they wanted to add the law of Moses. What a burden that would be to carry. Does that sound like too heavy a regime? They were disputing the good news of Jesus. Even though Jesus himself had said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent, meaning Jesus. He simply said the work of God is simply to believe. Just believe me that I died on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven and so that you wouldn't have to do anything to earn salvation because I did all that was necessary. That's what he did. Well, we might read Acts 15 and think, those guys were crazy. Like, what were they thinking? Why were they adding so much and making the good news into bad news? Why would they want to add such a heavy regime after all that Jesus had done for us? How many find it hard to relate to the words that they use here, that ordering them to follow the law of Moses? We, we, we wouldn't say that to each other. We wouldn't expect that of one another. And yet, when I think about how we as Christians today sometimes believe and behave I wonder if we have more in common with these Judaizers, as they were called, these men who wanted to add the law of Moses to the gospel. I wonder if we're more similar to them than we realize. For example, how many of us, when we reflect on our spiritual lives, maybe not necessarily 
today, but maybe yesterday or the day before, or maybe tomorrow or the day after. But how many of us, when we reflect on our spiritual lives, can sometimes feel discouraged, frustrated, or weary, or disenchanted, or cynical, or empty, just empty, you're just empty, or running on fumes, like you got nothing left. There have been times in my life when I've been able to relate to every one of those words. Maybe not all at once, maybe not every day, but there have been times when I can relate to being cynical or being disenchanted or being weary, spiritually weary. I don't think I'm the only one in this room that feels that, that, that knows what it's, how many, just nod to me if you understand what that means. Yeah. Life can feel heavy, even for people who say with our mouths that we trust in Jesus. I trust in Jesus. But because in our hearts we can sometimes be burdened with thoughts like, how can I mess up this way again? Our trust can evaporate as we focus on ourselves instead of focusing on Jesus. We might even sometimes have sneaking suspicion that God's patience with us is wearing thin. We may know in our minds that God loves us, but in our hearts, we may suspect we've disappointed him again, yet again. How many understand that? I think we we do. We We all do. And that's because we all too often focus on how much we've done for God or or on what we haven't done for God. Living as though we have to add, as if we have to add to what Jesus has done for us in order for him to be pleased with us. Do you know that if you fail, like fail, it hasn't changed how much he loves you one bit? That's encouraging. But I'm always focused on what I did or on what I didn't do. My wife Fiona will tell you how many times I have negative conversations with myself about things I've done or failed to do. And that's when my trust in Jesus is not in Jesus, but in what I can do or not do. In other words, something equivalent to the law of Moses that these guys were wanting to require people to do. Oh, I need to hear this sermon. The message of Acts 15 is that Jesus wants to turn that heaviness into joy. Amen? Amen. When the leaders in the church in Jerusalem debated this issue, created by people who wanted to add to what Jesus had done for us, the last words we read of the Apostle Peter, the very last words recorded of the Apostle Peter in the the book of Acts is, is this. But we believe... This is verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> what a great response to what these men wanted to require of people. The good news of Jesus is that we're saved by grace. And grace means undeserved favor. You can't do something to deserve grace. Grace is undeserved So if we're saved by grace, you can't do anything to do something to be saved. You can't do anything in order to save yourself. Only God can do it. It's undeserved. And when you live as though you have to do something to be saved, whatever you do, it'll never feel like enough. You'll always feel like, oh, that wasn't enough. God's still wanting more from me. As if your salvation depends on what you do or don't do. That's why this such a condition will only feel heavier and heavier and heavier, robbing us of joy. And I find it interesting that Luke, who is the man who wrote the Adventures of Acts, wrote he he referred to joy at both the beginning and the end of this story. Isn't that interesting? That as he's talking about these guys wanting to lay a heavy on people, in verse 3 he said, As Paul and Barnabas passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, Luke wrote that they brought great joy to all the brothers. There's great joy at the beginning of this story. Then at the end of this story, in verse 31, Luke wrote that when the non-Jewish Gentile Christians heard the letter that was written by the leaders in Jerusalem, 
It's saying that nothing was required of them for their salvation except to believe. They rejoiced because of its encouragement. This story is about Jesus turning heaviness into joy. Now, if you're a careful reader of this story, you'll note that the letter that the elders in Jerusalem wrote to the church in Antioch did include some requirements. There's four of them, actually. If you're a careful reader, you might be wanting to raise your hand and say, Hey, Ken, he did say more than just all you have to do is believe. He had, they, 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 they listed four requirements. Well, if you put all four of those requirements into the context of idol worship, which is they all fit into the context of idol worship, that's all the elders of Jerusalem were saying. They were saying, abandon idolatry and worship Jesus only. All those four restrictions that they listed in their letter had to do with idolatry. Well, do you know, do you know what requiring, do you know what depending on what you do or don't do is? It's idolatry. Josh, it's idolatry. You're making this what I can do into an idol that I need to bow to, I need to submit to what I do or what I don't do. When Jesus is saying, no, no, worship me. Don't, don't look at your own, what you can do or can't do. Just look at me. I've done it all. It's finished. I did everything that was necessary for you to have a life with me. Enjoy it without constantly criticizing yourself about what a piece of work you are. Come on. Let's be encouraged. All they asked was abandon idolatry and worship Jesus. If you struggle to believe that Jesus loves you exactly as you are right now, without you having to do anything except believe that Jesus died for you, then Jesus wants to set you free from the heaviness of thinking that you need to add to anything he's done to be loved by him. He wants to set you free this morning. At the end of this service, there's going to be an invitation that anybody who's been struggling, making something they do or don't do more important than what Jesus did, which is idolatry, you can come and I, I, David and I will want to pray for you just so that you can walk out of here free this morning. I don't want anyone walking out here heavy. He wants to turn your heaviness into joy. Now, how Jesus turns schism into joy. Schism is a word for division. As Luke wrote this story, it seems like he wanted to make sure his readers understood how serious this matter was and how the accuracy of the message Jesus has given us to proclaim was at stake. In verse 2, Luke wrote that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, meaning meaning with the people from Jerusalem who'd come to Antioch and who wanted to add to the grace which, by which Jesus wants to save us. So Paul and Barnabas, after having this dissension and debate in Antioch, went to Jerusalem to sort it out with the church leaders there. In verses 4 and 5, Luke writes, When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Well, we can see how seriously the church leaders considered this matter by how the apostles, it says in verse 6, the apostles and elders gathered together to consider the matter. Verse 7 says there was much debate in that gathering. And Luke then records Peter talking about how how God had affirmed the non-Jewish people by, by giving them the Holy Spirit as he did to us. Remember when he went to visit Cornelius, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit in Cornelius' household. Cornelius was a Roman, a a non-Jewish Roman centurion. And Peter said how God made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. In fact, Peter called the requirements that the people were trying to put on them as a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. Because it's too heavy. 
Then Luke wrote in verse 12, all the assembly felt, fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. I wonder, I, I think it's worth highlighting that in the midst of this schism, because make no mistake, this was a schism. This, this wasn't just a potential schism. This was a schism in the early church. And in the midst of it, Peter emphasized that God had already made it clear from his experience with Cornelius that there would be no distinction between us and them. And that's why I don't believe there should be any distinction between any of the nations represented here. And I've never felt that there are. I've always been encouraged at how we just dwell together in unity. And so, the way Luke writes the story, he clearly described God as being the one who made no distinction. It's God where this all begins. In verse 4, Luke wrote that they declared all that God had done. In verse 7, Peter said that God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And then verse 14, James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, quoted Peter saying, God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. So if the word unless at the very beginning of this episode represents human thinking, then the words no distinction obviously represents God's way of thinking and God's activity. But how often do we fail to heed that today? Two of our global workers, you may not have ever met them. I don't know if you were here when they shared at the front. They shared at the front one Sunday here. They work in Africa and they work with a mission agency that's uh, served in Africa since 1910. So this is a, a, a... a mission organization that's been around for a while, since 1910, and they've served in Africa themselves as a couple, uh, as a married couple, for 30 years, uh, in Equatorial Guinea, and in Ghana, and a few other countries that they've traveled to and from. And they were at a conference about 10 years ago, and this conference included pretty much all the workers with this organization that worked in Africa all the missionaries that have been sent out to go share the gospel in Africa. And at this assembly of all these workers who've been sent to minister to the people of Africa, a man stood up who was obviously African, and he challenged this assembly. And he said something like this. I'm paraphrasing. This mission agency has worked in Africa for over 100 years. And yet if you look around this room at this gathering of so many wonderful missionaries, it concerns me that I am the only face in this room that isn't white. Why is this agency not raising up and training African missionaries? The leaders in the room were struck to the heart. Convicted by the Lord. And soon after, they commissioned the two workers that have been sent out by Gateway, that that are representing Gateway Church in Africa, they commissioned those two workers to begin the partnering with the churches, many churches throughout Africa, many different nations, and to train and send out cross-cultural workers to make disciples of Christ among the unreached in Africa and beyond. Their goal is to have well-trained, spirit-filled African cross-cultural workers who will give their all for Jesus as they're sent out to the least reached globally. And they have made great progress I'm on their prayer letter list, and we pray for them on a weekly basis and on a Zoom time with many people from Gateway. And we have seen so many stories in their prayer requests of them traveling all around the continent of Africa, meeting with church leaders, African church leaders, who are raising up people in their own churches who are being called by the Lord to go out and to reach the unreached in Africa and beyond. If monoculturalism like that can happen 
in a 100-year-old mission agency that's in and reaches out to Africa, then it can certainly happen here in Canada. Even though many people from many different nations have become a part of Gateway Church, Gateway Church has never, since 19... 70 approximately, never had an elder who was not either North American or European. And yet look at the nations in this room. Why would that be? That's why I'm thrilled to see eight ethnicities represented on the response form that we've given you. Last week, David began the service by quoting Psalm 117, where it says, Praise the Lord all nations, extol him all peoples. That means you. You. Praise the Lord, all nations. And this week in Acts 15, 16 to 17, James, who who was actually the brother of Jesus and the leader in the church in Jerusalem, quoted a prophet named Amos. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind, all of mankind, not just the Jewish people, may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles, meaning the non-Jewish people, who are called by my name, says the Lord, may seek the Lord. Based on what had been shared in the gathering in Acts 15 by Paul and Barnabas, and based on what James quoted from Amos, James concluded in verse 19 by saying, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Let's not trouble them with a bunch of requirements that Jesus never put on us. And when the non-Jewish followers of Jesus in Antioch, where this whole chapter began, heard this news, they rejoiced. It says they rejoiced because of its encouragement, just as I read earlier. God had turned schism, division, into joy. So what can we learn about how the early church dealt with division? What can we learn? Division is rampant in our society. You just have to look south of the border at the election coming up on Tuesday. And by the way, we should, let's just say a quick prayer about that. Father... Lord, this is a nation that has a lot, of, a lot of influence in this world, and we want to see it led by the person you choose. Lord, we want to see it led by godly leadership, but we don't necessarily see godliness on either of the two candidates, but we don't know what you have in mind. Would you work out the results of this election according to your will? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We have division in our society, so how can the church be a model that the world will be attracted to rather than a reflection of the division that's all around us? Well, we want to be a model that the world will see a difference in. So the first thing we must do, and I'll say this with emphasis, is to personally commit ourselves to what Paul later referred to in another book of the Bible as the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. About 14 years after Acts chapter 15 was written, Paul wrote to a church that was in a city called Ephesus, where there was great potential for schism because the church in Ephesus was filled with both Jews and non-Jews, Gentiles. And Paul knew that they were struggling to get along. And so Paul urged them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness. Oh, those are such precious words. Humility and gentleness. With patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace, there's that word again, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. That's what I want us to be personally committed to. 
if we want to learn from the early church of how to deal with division. In Acts 15, 28, we see that the leaders in Jerusalem wrote to the church in Antioch saying, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. This is why hearing God is so important. If you don't hear God, you're just sharing your own opinions. I don't want people's opinions. I want to hear from the Holy Spirit. I want, I want to be led by Him. Hearing and agreeing with the Holy Spirit is paramount. The second thing we must be willing to do is to talk. Just to talk. I call this fellowshipping things through. Come on, let's just fellowship together over this. That's what I'll say to people. And we'll sit at a table and we'll talk. I've done this with some of you in this room where things have come up and I've gone to visit you and we've fellowshiped it through. Because conflict is inevitable, but we don't have to let it persist if we're willing to fellowship through it. The third thing we must commit ourselves to is to allow the Bible to influence our conclusions more than our own feelings or our own background. As I mentioned so often in the Sermon on Hearing God, that's why this is so important to know our Bibles. We want the Bible to be what we plant our, our, our convictions on, not our feelings, not our personal background. And I appeal to you to not let your feelings or your background trump what the Bible says. James was quick to quote and submit to Scripture as they resolved this schism. By committing ourselves to these three foundational practices, God can turn schism into joy as he reveals his will. Now, it wasn't planned that we were planning on starting the hearing God, or, 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 or the, 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 the series on Acts again in September, which means I would have preached this very same sermon the Sunday after Labor Day weekend. It wasn't planned that this sermon would be on the same day that I hand out these elders' process forms. That's, I wonder if that's a coincidence that the Lord arranged. Because it's relevant to these forms, what they discovered in Acts 15. And if you indicate no or unsure on your form, I'm going to be eager to fellowship that through with you. I'm going to want to talk and see what you're thinking and where you're coming from. And we can talk together. You'll hear where I'm coming from and we'll see if we can hear God together. But going back to how Jesus turns heaviness into joy, David and I are eager to pray with anybody who can relate to that list you see on your handout where it asks how many of us, when we reflect on our spiritual lives, are feeling any of those things that are listed there. If you can relate to any of that, of feeling like you messed up again or feeling that God's losing patience with you or, or that he's disappointed in you, we would love to pray with you at the front here. 